we are in a very unique time and culture. We're talking about parental guidance. And it is absolutely true that our children are being inundated with information and ideas. Uh, information and ideas are the battleground. They are where the battle rages. If I can sow my idea into your brain, did God really say? I can cause you to doubt what God has said and who God is and what God desires for your life. Tell somebody it's about information and it's about ideas. When we are unclear what God has said, we pass it on to our children. And sometimes the children pass it on to the parents. And the challenge that we're facing um, is that your children, whether they are 5 and 6, 10 and 12, 18 and 20, 30 and 40 and 50, they need mama and daddy to have a word. Do you have a word for your children? This is the parental guidance series. And parents, your children are asking questions because they're not sure what to understand, what's right, what goes, what doesn't go, how it's supposed to go. And, and they're coming to you as parents. If, if God is gracious, they come to you. If there's relationship, they come to you. If there's no relationship, they go somewhere else. Preach, Reverend. My, my concern is that parents be equipped to have a word. Uh, we've been talking about um, speaking words of wisdom. We started this last week, and I gave you three words of wisdom that you should speak, maybe four. Go back to, this, go back to the message. It's free. It's online. Check that out. I want to do part two today and continue this whole idea, speaking words of wisdom. Because wisdom is grasped and embraced by what is modeled to us and by what is spoken to us. I go too fast on that. Your children will get wisdom by what they see in you, how they see you move. Well, let me just give you the caveat for this message because I, I feel like we're already there. It's going to get rough up and through here. You might as well put your seatbelt on. There's going to be turbulence at about 12,000 feet. And once we get to 17,000 feet, uh, everything will smooth out on the flight. Um, and then we will make our initial entry into reality. Say amen. amen. But there's going to be turbulence today. And I just want you to be aware. Um, wisdom is shared in conversation, and not conversation where there is fussing. I heard one half of amen over here. And matter of fact, I don't know if it was an amen or an uh. It, was, it sounded more like an uh man. Uh, uh. It is shared in conversation. Um, and not with fussing, but it must be shared because at the end of the day, God will hold you as a parent and me as a parent accountable for the wisdom that I display and that I instruct out of. God held um, Eli, the prophet. He held him responsible for his raggedy, ratchet sons who worked at church. Hophni and Phinehas were his boys. And Hophni and Phinehas, they had top roles in church because their daddy was the priest. And they were sleeping with the women at the entrance to the temple. They were running a scheme. Does anybody else just embrace like the Bible is real? that this is what was going on. And the Lord said to Eli, he says, because you have gone light on your children, because you have um, accommodated them, and you left them in place knowing what they were doing, he says, 
this whole clan is going to die off and have no longer the privilege of priestly ministry in the house of God. And it was because of you. I told you I was going to get rough. I tried to give it to you early. So when it comes to wisdom, uh, the Bible says that we're to give it to our children, we're to give it to them regularly. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, when you, uh, when you sit down at home, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you go out the house, he said, you're, you're to teach them this word. And so that is the structure, that is the, um, uh, the, the framework for how we are to teach our children the wisdom of God. Um, I want to talk about three areas today. I want to talk about friending, sexing, and being. Somebody said, uh oh. Lord, help me in Jesus' name. I'm on your assignment. Help us. Because your children are asking questions about who is a friend. And if they haven't asked you yet, they're going to ask you about sex. Some of y'all are like, ain't nobody talked to me about sex. Is it as quiet online <laughs> as it is in this house? Can y'all say something online so we can hear you? <laughs> and we're going to talk about being, being in such a way that we focus on the glory of God. Let's talk about friending. You got to talk to your, your children about friending, finding, forging, connections. Because loneliness is real and bullying is real. There are a lot of, in a, in a world of digital connections, people are lonely. Grown folks is lonely. Children are lonely. They, they don't know where to find real friendship because everything they see on Instagram and TikTok, they're not on Facebook. The old people are on Facebook. I got off because I don't want to be old. I'm kidding. Um, but but, but they're, they're connected digitally, but they feel alone. And they're hoping that people will connect with them, but they feel disconnected oftentimes. And some of our kids are, are in school trying to figure out what circle of friends do I fit in? And, and, and who, who can I be friends with? And, and sometimes they're getting bullied, but they don't say anything when they get home because they're not sure what to do. Am I making sense here? The word of the Lord gives us some instruction here. Proverbs 12, 26, if we can go there. Um, the, the, the essence of the scripture says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. If you do anything to help your children, help them choose their friends carefully. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. You got to be mama and daddy. Even if mama and daddy ain't together, y'all better get on the same page here. You better say, baby, we want to help you choose your friends carefully. To choose carefully means to, it's, it's the idea, it means to meander about um, looking for a, a, a business opportunity. In other words, when you're looking for a business opportunity, when you're looking to decide if this is a good investment to make, you take your time and you fill it out. I feel the anointing happening right now. Well, you, you don't just jump into an investment because relationship and friendship is an investment of your time and your money and your energy. And the Bible says you better, yes, so you better choose wisely. You better meander about and see if this is going to be profitable for me and for you. As a matter of fact, I'm not as concerned about how much it profits you as it profits me. And you ought to ask your children, help me understand the profit of that relationship to you. How do you benefit from that relationship? How does it help you grow? How is it helping you become who God has called and designed you to be? I feel the anointing happening up in here. Is anybody getting this? You got to help your children decide, is this person for you? 
because a, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And you'll know, son, you'll know, daughter, when you're going through hell and high water, were they there for you? Did they show up for you? Did they offer you wisdom? Did they offer you support? Were they kind? Were they honest? The Bible says uh, um, it's like a business investment, but it also is like a military reconnaissance mission. Uh, he says, um, choose wisely. To choose is like being on a, on a military reconnaissance mission where you are spying and you are checking and you're looking from afar to see what's really going on. Baby, if I were you, I would back all the way up and I would put some binoculars on and just look and check and watch and check the patterns and check the behavior and check how they treat people and how do they treat their mother and how do they treat their brother and how do they treat people they don't know and how to check it out from afar, gather some strategic information so you can make your decision without being all the way up in there because the truth of the matter is if you're all the way up in there, you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, I'm going to hold up for a moment. Is this making sense to anybody? The Bible would say, let's go to 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Write down Proverbs 16, 28. We won't go there, but the Bible says um, that a perverse person stirs up contention. Or, In other words, a perverse person is a problem-oriented person. People who are always problems always stir up mess. Tell somebody he's speaking wisdom to us. Some of y'all grown people, grown people, grown people. You got some people who ain't been nothing but a problem. Every time you turn around, there's mess. Well, you got a friend who all they do is cause mess so that now this relationship is breaking up over here because they said something over there. Help me preach right now. You, you better tell your children, if you got a friend who's always a problem, always in the middle of mess, always the source of issues and stuff, every time stuff goes down, their name comes up. That's a, that's a place where you want to back up. My wife's grandmother, all her wisdom, when your hand is in the lion's mouth, you ease it out. In some relationships, you got to teach your children, listen, I'll back up from that. Yeah. Friending. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this. Um, is that it right there? That's, they're like, we ain't, is that what we're talking about? Uh, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Keep going. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That's the name for de the devil, Satan. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Guess this one now. Therefore, baby, baby, little shorty, Pookie, therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Here's the principle I want you to grasp. He says, um, do not be unequally yoked together. The yoke was for learning and pulling. The yoke was tied around oxen. And the Bible says never tie a strong oxen with a, with a, 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 um, a donkey. In other words, you, you don't tie an, an oxen with a donkey because that makes it difficult to get the work done. The word literally means to be 
out of balance. So, so, so the, the idea is don't hook up with people where you're out of balance, where, where you bring everything to the table and all they bring is their appetite. Where, where, where you're trying to walk in the wisdom of God and they don't know nothing about God, God's wisdom. They, that's not their flow. They're not into it. The idea is don't have, uh, um, the, the word is used for, for intercourse. But it's not always sexual. I mean, don't get intimate with, don't get connected to, don't get tied up, tangled up, lost in nobody's love who you're not equal with. Equal in the sense that you, you're pursuing God, you're walking with God, you're chasing God, you're seeking God, and they're like, I don't know if I'm going to church this week. I think this message might be more for the parents than for the children's. I said this before. It's so important that parents embrace the wisdom of God. Because we, we don't give our children what we say, we give them who we are. He says, choose people that you can be yoked together with. And he says, if they're in the darkness and you're in the light, that's an imbalance. If they ain't got no plans and you ain't got nothing but plans. <laughs> they got no vision. All you can see is destiny. You cannot drag somebody along with you in the hopes that they will catch up to you. That would be a lack of balance. Somebody help me preach right now. Give the Lord a praise if that's a word for somebody here. You, you, can't, you can't be trying to bring people along hoping they will catch up to you. Let them catch up by themselves. Holler at your boy later if perchance I'm still around. Y'all tracking? All right, you got to talk about friending. Is anybody getting equipped today? Can I give y'all one or two more? Or y'all trying to get to the game? What y'all trying to do? Talk about sexing. Did y'all see that? Did y'all see that? I said, talk about sexing. Why are y'all so nervous to talk about sex in church? You watching the videos. You go to the Beyonce concert. Do not play with me on today. You ain't have children not having sex. See, when I come to this church to preach, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> I come full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Why aren't you talking to your children about sex? Did you know that there is an undercurrent that quietly comes for your children's sex and sexuality? It's happening in your family. They're little cousins. They're, they're, they're uncles. Sometimes they're aunties, undercurrents. They go to school and their friends are having conversations about sex. They're teachers. And the whole school system want to talk to them about um, sex education. And you don't want to talk to your children. You're not confused, obviously. Well, maybe you are, a little bit. First time I ever heard about living a sexually pure life, I was in college. I was in college. So let me tell you, what, what do we say to our children about sex? 
So we're speaking wisdom. We're speaking wisdom. We're speaking wisdom. And the Bible helps us see that Jesus is the wisdom of God. I went too fast. We're speaking wisdom. And the Bible says that Jesus is wisdom personified. He is the display of God's wisdom in humanity. So anytime you speak wisdom, your wisdom cannot be your own. Your wisdom must be consistent with the Jesus who is God's wisdom personified. I didn't come to condemn nobody. I hope the Holy Spirit is convicting you. That's between you and him. Because when he convicted me, it was the best thing that happened in my life. Amen. I wouldn't be married to the woman I've been married to for the last 32 years had the Lord not convicted me about my raggedy engagement with sex. <laughs> and I got six rousing applauses because ain't nobody going to give the Lord a praise that what he did in my life, he's able to do in your children's lives, he's able to do in your life. Oh! I hope to see the people of God blessed because we get this very important area of our lives aligned. I've noticed, by the way, today that some people have had a hard time looking at the preacher. (laughs) And I just want you to know, I understand. It's quite okay. Here you go. Help them. You want to help your children. Help them by first asking them, what do you understand sex is all about? Just ask them, what do you understand that sex is about? Ask them at eight. Is that too early? Ask, what do you understand? And listen for what they say. When they say something like, um, Sex is when two people, your ears should, you should listen very closely. When they say, sex is when a mommy and a daddy, you should keep listening. When they say, sex is when a husband and a wife. That's when you ought to run around the house and give the Lord a praise like you're in church. That's when you ought to clap to the Lord and celebrate him. Listen, we've all made mistakes. But it doesn't mean our children have to make the same mistakes. Are you following what I'm saying? Sometimes what gets normalized seems like the only option. And so because it was normalized to us, and this is the way we were taught, and this is the way we experience sex, then we think because this has been normalized that this is the only thing I can teach my children. Or I just let them learn on their own. So help them by asking them the question. Help them by teaching them God's purposes for sex. Can I give y'all God's purposes for sex? Well, I was hoping, ain't nobody say amen, but except Michael. Michael, the missionary who got two babies, said, give us, Pastor, I want the purposes for sex. Does anybody want the purposes for sex from God's perspective? It's threefold. It's pleasure in marriage. Pleasure in marriage. What about me and my girlfriend? Pleasure in marriage. What about, I like when me and my boo get down. Pleasure in marriage, if you like it, <laughs> pleasure. Listen, it is a gift from God for pleasure in marriage. God wants you to be satisfied. He wants you to be full of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> anointed and fire baptized. He wants you to fall out in the Spirit. <laughs> In marriage. 
If you fall out in the spirit outside of marriage, you're not in the spirit. Teach your children that sex is God's gift for pleasure in marriage. Teach them that it is to, to strengthen the promise of God over their life. And the promise that one person makes to another, the commitment that we make, it is to strengthen the promise, the covenant promise that we make to God. Y'all are like, what does that got to do with anything? It's to strengthen the promise because when you come together in sex, in marriage, it is to strengthen this connection that we have to one another. Because here's what happens. Some of y'all may not have known this. When you have sex with anybody, there is a release of neurochemicals that, that are, listen, they're designed for pleasure and for bonding. So that there is a memory etched in your emotional life and in your brain that when this makes you feel good like this, do that again. Is this too much for y'all? It is, it, God has designed it this way so that there are neurochemicals that are released that makes you say, this is the place to go. Here is the challenge. Here is the problem. When you have the, you go, listen, your brain doesn't know what the context is. It only knows that it feels good. And so if it feels good, is it still good to you? I, I can't even preach in this place. It's too much. When it feels good, if it's out of context, your brain just says it feels good. Can we do that again? And then you can find yourself, listen to me closely, connected to someone who's not really for you. And we get it twisted, and that's why some of us have tried a few somebodies who wasn't good for us, because we were confused by the pleasure. I'm going to stand on a chair and kick the devil right in the head. That's why the Bible says that all sins, well, it says only the sin that is sexual is a, is a sin against your own body. And it has an internal impact on you so that you can't even think clearly and be clear about where you're supposed to be. And you can be with somebody and the sex feels good, but they're with somebody else and she said or he said the sex felt good too. And which one of these things is supposed to be? Wow. Ain't nobody going to help me preach up in here. He says we're to remind them that, or teach them that sex is for pleasure, it's for strengthening the promise, and it's for procreation. God had a plan for sex when he gifted it to humanity. And it was to, listen, it was so that he could populate the earth with godly offspring so that when we have children, we could teach them the wisdom of God and they could walk in a relationship with God and, and God will get the glory and they go into the world and business and in medicine and in entertainment and in whatever so that they take the glory of God because they were taught the, they were taught the way of God. Oh, my Lord, is this making sense? We, we, we thought sex was just for something to do. But God was trying to build a lineage of people who would give him glory. You can be a freak and give God glory. <laughs> oh, what your religious self. Y'all so religious. I ain't fooling with y'all today. Your religious self. Oh, I can be. Yes, be, listen, get yourself a good wife, a good husband, and say, I want to learn how to be your freak. <laughs> wrong with y'all up in here. You try to play the pastor like y'all don't know what's up. <laughs> All right, let's get to this last part. <laughs> it, we help them by asking them, teaching them, and reminding them. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. 1 Corinthians, now this is where we need to be. Flee! 
The word flee means run, Forrest, run. <laughs> Get up out, break camp, ghost, split, be out. Flee from sexual immorality. Yeah. All of the sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Son, daughter, don't you know that your body houses the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Who is in you, whom you have received from God, you don't belong to you. I don't care how horny you get. I don't care what song led you in. Y'all don't know how to talk to your children like this. You might need to talk to you about this. You were bought at a price. You were purchased. Uh, the Lord saw you and saw your need for forgiveness, and he bought you. He purchased you. He paid the price for you. No matter how high the price was, he was willing to pay the price for you, so your body no longer belongs to you. Therefore, the NIV says, honor, your, honor God with your bodies. The New King James Version says, glorify God. Everything you do with your eyes, bring God glory. Everything you do with your mouth, bring God glory. Everywhere these hands go, in church and late in the midnight hour, let them bring glory to God. Help me preach somebody. He says, uh, honor God with your bodies. And he's, re he's a referring to the entire corpus of you. Yeah. He's referring to the physical body, your physical being. And he said, whatever you do with this, with these, with this, with these, with all of this, bring God glory. Tell somebody near you, we got to tell the children. And we got to tell each other. All of this, Come on, we're participating in class today, class. All of this has to bring God glory. Sometimes you got to talk to it. Hand, bring God glory. Sometimes you got to get in the mirror, say, ear, bring God glory. Sometimes you got to look down at it, self. In my life, <laughs> may God be lifted high. May God get the glory. Oh, welcome to church. Y'all like, I'm not coming back to this church. <laughs> All right, we're going to the deep end of the pool. We're going home. This has been a long service. I make no apologies. If I don't teach you, I will be held responsible as the father of this house. The fire, yeah. The fire of God will not break out in here where we have been playing concerning holiness and righteousness. I'll preach to 12 people every week if I have to. But I believe God is bigger. I want to talk about being, living to glorify God because there's a great deal of cultural confusion around gender and sexuality. Tell somebody, we're going into the deep end now. And, and, and I don't have all of the understanding and why, and I want to I approach this as humbly as I can. And I want to also approach it as biblically as I can. But our children are, are they're struggling with confusion. Mommy, I'm a little boy, but I want to be a girl. Mommy, 
I'm a little girl. Can I be a boy? And what is stirring in the minds of little people is becoming revelation in the lives of older people. Stay with me. And we've got teenagers asking for gender reassignment surgeries. And parents, well, well, well baby, if you feel like... And whatever you believe you're supposed to be is, I just want to be a good parent to you. And so, culturally, the understanding is that sex is seen as a biological assignment at birth, which is not inconsistent with biblically. Where, we, where we're getting off track is that culturally, gender is seen as, um, I had to make a note, as a sociological construct that can change over time. I don't know why y'all are shocked. So that I can, I can be anatomically, biologically assigned male. But if something happens in my world, and I don't know what it might be, I can feel like I don't want to be that anymore. And so now you can go to get hormone treatments, surgeries to remove parts, to shift parts, but you cannot change your genetic I'm not here to shame anyone for where they are or where they've been. I'm here to bring clarity to the house of God because our children are part of a culture where this conversation prevails. Are you trans? Are you cis? Are you non-binary? The challenge comes when we leave out the final moral authority of God. And we're having these discussions around our feelings and our opinions and our desire to let people do whatever they want to do. And I can't stop you from doing what you want to do or what you have done. I want to love you where you are. But I want to understand what thus says the Lord. There is a final authority, and God is the authority. We, we cannot keep living through this culture on our feelings. Understand your emotions. But don't live according to your feelings, your urges, what seems right. There is a way that seems right to a man. Somebody said, God has something to say. So how do you parent your children? Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Let's go to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We'll start right at the beginning, early in the Bible. So God. created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living thing, every living creature that moves on the ground. God says, I created. 
out of my wisdom. And I created them male and female. I hate, hate to be the bubble buster today, but the system of God's wisdom is binary. To do otherwise is to work contrary to what Paul says is natural. God is the instigator of natural. God is the instigator of, of, of our sex and our gender. And he paired the two according to our anatomical design. You don't have to look far to see what God was up to. Come with me to Psalm 139. We're going to shut it down. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. Can you praise God for what he has made you? Can you give the Lord a praise, Lord? I thank you for all of this, all of this estrogen and all of this, Lord, all of this, I want to praise you. I thank you for making me a crazy guy. You knew what you were doing, and, and I want to praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully He's, he says, look, I know that it's the awesome hand of God. Lord, I'm fearfully designed by an amazing God. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Verse 15, he says, my frame was not hidden from you. What I was supposed to be was not hidden from you. So I can't go to the doctor and ask him what I'm supposed to be. I can't go to my school teacher and ask him what I'm supposed to be. Hopefully my parents are close enough to God to tell me that God knit me together in the womb and God assigned me because God has an assignment for my life. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together, it means I was knit together. God took his time. Somebody said God took his time. He took his time to put it together. He took his time and, and wove it together. I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Where do we go with this? God is the author of our lives, our genders, our sexual design, which are God, with our God assigned anatomies. This does not mean that some people are not struggling. Where people are struggling, we exercise compassion. Don't be mean Christians who go out and beat people down. We should go with the understanding that somebody has had a struggle and the enemy has engaged them in the struggle. People are looking. Listen, whenever you want to change your identity, you're struggling with your identity. It's the question, who am I? Why am I? What am I? And there's a God who is the I am who tells you who you am from his perspective out of his love, out of his care. Y'all tracking with me? We align our wills with his will. I, I, if, if I could have this conversation more frequently, I would say to people, say to your children, you have to align. I know what you might be feeling. Where does that come from, you think? But God has a will for your life. We don't shame people when they're struggling. My heart goes out to them. Here's the crux of the matter. We were created to bring God glory. So we remind our children 
that no matter what your struggle is, you were created for God's glory, for God's renown, to make people know God in a clear way. But can I do it this way? Not if God has done it that way.